Michael wasn't talking to her, and that was bad. He wasn't sullen, like Shane got from time to time. He was just thoughtful. That made the drive uneasily quiet. It was fully dark out. Not that she could see through the window tinting anyway. The world didn't seem real to her anymore, and her head ached. This is the deal you made with Amelie, Michael said. To work for him. No. I made the deal with Amelie. Then she told me to work for him. Or learn from him. Is there a difference? Claire smiled. Yeah. I don't get paid. Brilliant plan, genius. Is anybody paying you? Actually, she had no idea. The thought hadn't occurred to her to ask Amelie for money. Was that normal to get paid for a thing like this? Suppose it was, if she was supposed to risk her life with Mernin on a regular basis. I'll ask, she offered. No, Michael said grimly. I'll ask. I won't talk to Amelie about this whole thing anyway. Don't get all older brother on me, Michael. It's not safe. You may be one of them now, but you're not. One of them? Yeah, I know that. But you're way too young for this, Claire. And you don't know what you're doing. You didn't grow up in this town. You don't understand the risks. What? Death? I only understand that one pretty well already. She was feeling tired and achy, but also strangely annoyed with Michael's protectiveness. Look, I'm fine, okay? Besides, I learned a lot today. She'll be happy. Trust me. Amelie's mood isn't what bothers me. Michael said. It's you. You're changing, Claire. She looked straight at him. Like you haven't? <laughs> Cheap shot. Look, I'm sick of having to tiptoe around Shane. Don't mean we do it with you too. Ah, now Michael was annoyed too. Great. Tell you what, I'll stop nagging you about your life if you'll stay out of mine. You're not my brother, you're not my dad. No, he interrupted. I'm the guy who says if you get to stay in the house. He wouldn't. He wouldn't. Michael, you made a deal with Amelie without talking to anyone, and then you covered it up. Look, the only reason you even came clean was because I saw the bracelet. If I hadn't, you'd still be lying to us. That doesn't exactly make you the ideal housemate. Michael paused for a second. And then there's Shane. How am I to blame for Shane? You're not. But I can't deal with both of you. Not now. So just straighten up, Claire. No more lying and no more risk-taking, alright? I'll convince Emily to let you out of these sessions with Mernin. You're too young to be doing this. She ought to know that. No more lying. No more risk-taking. Claire shifted and felt the bottle in her pocket, and had a flash of that perfect clarity again. She wondered what Michael would have to say about her letting Mernin give her the crystals. Probably nothing. He was talking about throwing her out of the house, right? So he probably didn't care at all. The car slowed and turned, then bumped down a rutted drive. Home. Claire bolted before Michael could say anything else to her. Shane was in the kitchen, pouring himself a beer. He toasted her silently, took a sip, and nodded towards a pot on the stove. Chili, he said. Extra garlic. Michael was closing the kitchen door, and he sighed. What is this going to stop? When you quit drinking blood? Shane, don't get pissy. I made yours garlic free. Shane looked at her again and frowned a little. You okay? Sure. Why wouldn't I be? Just... I don't know. Whatever. He slung on an arm. He slung an arm over her shoulders and kissed her on the forehead. Bad day, probably. Let's see. She'd been threatened by Eve's brother, had her wrist cut, and then played keep away with Mernin for hours. Did that qualify as a bad day in Morganville? Probably not. No body count. Not yet, anyway. Michael pushed past them and threw the door into the living room. Claire pulled free of Shane's arm and went to the stove to ladle herself a bowl of chilli. It smelled hot and delicious, but mostly hot. She tasted a drop and nearly choked. Was it usually this molten lava, wicked spicy? Everything felt raw to her right now. She supposed that was a side effect of the crystals. I thought I heard you, Shane said. Weirdest thing. I heard your voice today. Right out of thin air. I thought you... I kept thinking about Michael, how he used to be during the daytime, when he was a ghost. You thought I was... I thought maybe something happened, he said. I called your cell number, the new one. She'd left it in a, back a backpack. Claire reached down and unzipped the pocket, then checked the phone. 
Three calls, all from Shane, with voicemails. Sorry, she said, I didn't hear it. Guess I need to turn the ringer up. He looked at her very steadily, and she felt the cold spot in her centre. The place had chilled while she'd been with Mernin, slowly warm. You worry me, he said, and put his hand on her cheek. You know that, right? She nodded and hugged him. Unlike mine, Mernin, he was warm and solid, and his body just moulded right into hers. Perfect and sweet. When he kissed her, she tasted beer and chilli, but only for a second. After that, it was pure shame, and she forgot all about Mernin and any kind of physics except fiction, friction. Shane backed her up against the stove. She felt the low heat of the burn on at her back, but she was too preoccupied to worry much about bursting into flames from outside sources. Shane just had that effect on her. I missed you, he whispered, brushing her damp lips with his. Want to go upstairs? What about my chili? Get it to go. There were good things about the way she felt tonight, she decided. Her nerves might be raw, but that only made his touch all the sweeter. She would have felt awkward, usually, and uncertain, and scared. But it seemed like the afternoon that had started with Jason and ended with Mernin's snarl had burnt all that out of her. I'm not hungry, she said breathlessly. Come on. She felt as wild and free as a little kid, running up the stairs with Shane in hot pursuit. And when he grabbed her around the waist, spun her around into his room, and kicked the door shut, she squealed in delight, and wiggled to fit herself against his warm, hard body as she kissed him again, breathless and flying. He kissed as though their lives depended on it, as though it, as though it, it were an Olympic sport event, and he intended to earn a medal. Somewhere in the back of her head, she was chattering to herself, warning that this was going to go too far, that she was just making things worse for both of them, but she couldn't help it. Before long, they were stretched out together on Shane's bed, on his big, warm, and his big, warm hands were teasing her under the hem of her shirt, stroking the fluttering skin of her stomach, and stealing her breath. She lost it all when he spread his, her, his fingers out, pressing his palm flat against hers, and she felt an almost irresistible impulse to feel those hands all over, everywhere. Her heart was hammering hard enough to make her dizzy, and it was all just so perfect. She reached down and pulled up her shirt, slowly, feeling the cool air slip over tender skin, up to the bottom line of her bra, then up. Shane stopped. I want to, she whispered against his mouth. Please, Shane, I want to. She sat up and reached for the clasp on her bra and unhooked it. Please. He pulled back from her and sat up, head down, and when he looked up, he licked his lips and his eyes were wide and dark, and she could fall into them, fall forever. I know, he said, me too, but I made promises, and I'm going to keep them, especially one to your parents, because your dad said he'd hunt me down like a dog. Shane gave her a wild, a bitter smile, sucks to be me, but she felt her bra slipping and quickly grabbed to hold it in place. She felt ridiculous now, and wounded. He sighed. Don't, Claire. It's not like I'm a saint or anything. I'm not. And trust me, for you, a saint would buy a condom and go to confession. But it's not about that. It's about keeping my word. And around here, my word is all I've got. She wanted him with a red fury that was all out of character for her. But somehow, the way he said it, the way he looked her straight in the eyes, she felt all that fall away, and the fury turned into something pure hot and silver. Besides... Shane said. I'm all out of condoms, and I hate confession. He put his arms around her and hooked her bra with an ease that showed he had plenty of practice. She threw a pillow at him. Somebody was running around outside the house. Claire woke up with a start, instantly tense as she heard the distant rattle of metal. She rolled out of bed and peeked out in the blinds. Her bedroom window looked out on the back, a glorious corner vantage point, and she had a clear view of the fence and the trash cans on the other side. Somebody was definitely out there, a black shape in the moonlight. Claire could see him moving around, but couldn't tell what he was doing. She reached for her cell phone and dialed 911, and told the operator she needed either Joe Hess or Travis Lowe. Detective Lowe picked up the call, sounded wide awake even at 3 in the morning. Claire described what she was seeing in a whisper, as if whoever was across the yard might hear her. It's probably Jason. She it's probably Jason, she said. 
She heard the scratch of pen on paper and the other end of the phone. Why Jason? Can you see his face? No, she admitted, but Jason told me. He practically admitted it about the dead girl. I think it's Jason. Honest. Did he threaten you, Claire? The cotton her wrist was still throbbing. I guess she could say so, she said. I was trying to tell you about it, but I... I had things to do. More important than keeping us in the loop? Never mind, what happened? Shall I tell you when you get here? Patrol cars en route. Where did you see him today? At the university, she said, and told the story he didn't interrupt. And told the story. He didn't interrupt her, just let her talk. And she could hear him continuing to take notes. When she paused for breath, Lo said, You know that was stupid, right? Look, next time you see him, you start screaming bloody murder and put me in his on speed dial. Jason's nobody to play around with. But we were in public. He wouldn't have. Ask Eve about why he ended up in jail in the first place, Claire. Next time, don't hesitate. This isn't about you being strong. It's about you living through the day, alright? Trust me. She swallowed hard. I do. Is he still there? I don't know. I can't see him. He might have gone. The patrol car ought to be there in just a couple of seconds. They're doing a silent approach. You see them yet? No. But my room faces the alley. Something moved in the yard and she felt a lurch of pure adrenaline. I think... I think he's in the yard now. Coming to the house. To the back. Go wake up Michael and Shane. Make sure Eve's okay. Go now, Claire. She wasn't dressed, but she supposed it didn't really matter. The oversized t-shirt she was wearing came to her knees anyway. She unlocked her door and swung it open and yelled in shock. Tried to, anyway. She couldn't quite get the sound out because Oliver's hand clapped over her mouth, spun her around and dragged her backward over the threshold. She screamed, but it was barely a buzz in her throat. Her bare heels scraped on the wood as she tried to get her feet under her, but he had her helpless and off balance. She dropped the phone. She could hear Lo's voice distantly whispering her name, but it was blotted out by Oliver's soft voice in her ear as he bent close and said, I only want to talk. Don't make me hurt you, girl. You know I will if you force me. She went still, breathing hard. Had he been out there in the yard? How had he got up here so fast? Did the protections of the house keep him out? No. They only work against uninvited humans now because Michael's... Michael is a vampire. Oliver had some way in and out. Easy access. God. Good girl. Stay quiet. Oliver whispered. He looked up and down the hall, moved the painting next to the doorway and pressed the hidden switch. The secret doorway across from Eve's room opened with a soft sigh and he dragged her inside, then shut it. No knob on the inside. The release switch was up a flight of stairs. And he'd never let her go, or never let her get there if she tried to run. When he let her go, Claire stayed where she was. He let his voice return to normal levels, not afraid of being overheard, not here. I thought it was time we had a talk. You signed an agreement with, with Amelie. That hurts me, Claire. I thought we had a special friendship. And after all, I did offer first. Oliver smiled at her. That cold and oddly kind smile that had suckered her in the first few times she'd met him. You turned me down. So why, I wonder, did you decide that Amelia would be a better choice? He might know about Mernin, but not what Mernin did. Amelia being pretty specific, he could never know that. She smells bitter, Claire said, and she made me cookies. Somehow after the day she'd had, Oliver just didn't seem all that terrifying anymore until he had hit, until he bared his fangs and his eyes went a strange wide black no games he said the room's soundproof Amelia used to play with the victims here you know it's a killing jar when you're inside so probably should be, should be more polite if you intend to see morning Claire held up her left wrist the golden bracelet glinted in the light bite it Oliver you can't touch me. You can't touch anybody in this house. I don't know how you got in, but... He grabbed her right wrist and ripped away the bandage covering the cut that Jason had made. It broke open, and a red trickle ran from it down the interior of her arm. Oliver licked it off. Okay. That's just gross, Claire said faintly. 
Let go. Let go. You belong to Amelie, he said, and he let her go. I can taste it. Smell it on you. You're right. I can't touch you. Not anymore. But the others? You're wrong about them. While they're in the house, they're safe. But not out there. Not in my town. Not for long. I made a deal. Did you? Do you see in writing that your friends would be protected from all attacks? Because I very much doubt that, little Claire. We've been writing agreements for thousands of years, and you're only 16 years old. You have no idea what kind of deal you've made. Oliver actually sounded a little sorry for her, and that was scary. He folded his arms and leant against the door. He was in his usual good guy disguise tonight, a tie-dye t-shirt, battered cargo pants, his grey and curling hair pulled back in a ponytail. Probably just clothes up common ground, she figured. He smelt like coffee. She wondered what Oliver wore on his days off, if he wasn't trying to intimidate. Pajamas? Fuzzy slippers? One thing she figured out about the vampires in Morganville, they were never exactly what they seemed to be. Even the bad ones. <laughs> Fine, she said, and backed away from him until her heels hit the first step. She sat down. You'll tell me what I've done. You upset the balance of power in the town, and that's a terrible thing, little Claire. You see, Amelia intended to be the queen of this little kingdom. She thought I was safely dead when she did so. When I came here a year ago, many people decided that they'd rather listen to me than to her. Not all, of course, or not even a majority. But she's won no real friends during her long existence. And it isn't only the humans who are trapped here, you know. It's the vampires as well. This was a new idea to her. What are you talking about? We can't leave, he said. Not without her permission. As I said, she fancies herself the cold white queen. And most are content to let her. Not all. I was working to come to some arrangements with her. To let a number of us leave Morganville and set up a community outside of her influence. Things had been static here for 50 years, you see. Since she made the last vampire. Now Amelia feels the need to protect her position. She's blocked me. She won't allow me to make a move without her permission. He lowered his chin and stared at her, and it chilled her deep inside. I don't like to be controlled. I tend to get... unhappy. Why are you talking to me? What can I do? You, stupid little child, are her pet. When you want something, she indulges you. I want to know why. Emile hadn't exactly indulged her the last time they talked, although the cell phone sitting abandoned in her room might argue otherwise. I don't know. She thinks you have something she needs, or she'd hardly bother. She's seen whole cities die without shredding a tear or lifting a finger. It's not altruism. Mernin. It's about Mernin. If I weren't learning from him... She couldn't say that. Didn't even dare to really think it through. Oliver was unnerving, and sometimes he seemed downright psychic. Maybe she's lonely, he laughed, a harsh bark of sound with no amusement in it. She certainly deserves to be. He took a step forward. Tell me why she needs you, Claire. Tell me what she's hiding, and I'll make a deal. A perfectly straightforward one. I'll give you your friends my direct protection. No one will hurt them. She didn't say anything this time. She just looked back at him. She didn't dare not to look at him. Even when she was watching him, she had the eerie feeling that somehow he was creeping up behind her, ready to do something awful to her when she least expected it. Olive made a sound of deep frustration. You stupid, stupid girl. He shoved past her, going up the stairs so lightly the wood hardly ever creaked. After a second, the hidden, noblest door sighed open. Claire got up, steadied herself for a second, and then stepped out into the hallway. Nobody else had heard a thing, apparently. It was quiet as the grave. Oliver's hands closed around her shoulders, and he moved her out of his way by simply picking her up and putting her down, as if she weighed nothing. He didn't let her let go once he'd done it. He stepped up behind her, bent down, and whispered, Not a sound, Claire. If you wake your friends, and they come against me, I'll destroy you all. Understand? She nodded. She felt the cold pressure of his hands go away, but not his presence, and she was surprised when she looked back and saw that he was gone. 
as if he'd never been there at all. She pressed the button behind the painting and the hidden door sealed itself. Then she picked up her phone from the floor of her bedroom. The call had ended. Travis Lowe was probably on his way over, burning sirens all the way. She sat down and waited for the panic to start. There just had to be something out there in the alley, given the response. It wasn't only a couple of cops, some yellow tape and a write-up in Captain Obvious's underground newspaper. It looked, it looked from Claire's window like a full-blown CSI-style investigation, with people in white jumpsuits, collecting evidence and everything. There was a big blocky van with heavily tinted windows that she guessed housed vampire detectives or forensics people or something, with the emblem of the Morganville police on the side and she guessed the majority of people roaming around in Michael's backyard this morning were, in fact, the undead. Crime-solving undead. That was new. She wasn't sure what she was feeling anymore. Lightheaded, disconnected, looped. Last night had felt like a dream, and it had passed in a blur from time to time. She and Shane had come upstairs until she'd heard the rattle of trash cans in the alley. Someone was ringing the doorbell downstairs. She didn't move away from the window. Couldn't seem to convince herself to move at all, in fact. It was probably the cops. Travis Lowe had, as she'd thought, already come racing to the rescue. On finding her unfanged and still alive, he'd call in a full-on police assault. So those were probably de de detectives Gretchen and Hans, or maybe Richard Morell coming to take her statement. Claire looked down at herself. She'll probably get dressed. Her wrist was a mess, smeared with slow leaking blood, and she pressed her t-shirt against it before she could think about what she was doing. Great, now she wasn't only undressed, she was undressed in bloody nightclothes. It took ten minutes to shower, change, and bandage her arm, and then she padded down the stairs in bare feet to face the music. Her housemates were all standing in the living room, and they all looked at her with identical expressions, blank enough that she came to a stop at the steps. What? Claire asked. What did I do? What did I do now? Michael stepped aside so Claire could see who was sitting cross legged in the chair, flipping through a bubblegum pink edition of Teen People, Monica Morell. She was dressed in a tight fitting pink top with diamonds that spell out bitch or princess, and white short shorts that even Daisy Duke would have thrown out as too trashy. Her tan was deep and dark, and she was lazily dangling a pink flip flop with a yellow flower on top from her perfectly manicured toes. Hey, Claire, she said and stood up. I thought we could grab some breakfast. I... What? Breakfast, Monica said, drawing out the word. Most important meal of the day? Do you even have parents? She felt ridiculously off balance. I don't understand. Why are you here? She leant against... Shane leant against the wall, glaring at Monica. He had a serious bedhead thing going on. And Claire wanted to run his hands through his thick, soft hair and return to its usual shaggy mess. What a good question. The second best one being, who let her inside? And we're going to have to throw out that chair. The smell's never going coming out. I let her in, Michael said quietly. And that got him a stare from Shane. Lay off the daggers. It was better to let her in than have her pitch a fit on the porch with all the cops around. We've already got enough trouble. What's this we, pale face? I mean that in the vampire sense, not... Shut up, man. Claire rubbed her forehead, feeling her headache blooming back to hot, throbbing life. She ignored Michael and Shane with an effort and focused on Monica, who had a malicious smile curving her lips. You're enjoying this, Claire said. Monica shrugged. Of course. They're jackasses to me most of the time. It's nice to see them take it out on each other for a change. Not that I care. Monica arched one perfect groomed eyebrow. So, I know you like coffee. I've seen you drinking it. Eve stepped in between them, and for a second, Claire thought her friend honestly looked dangerous. You're not taking Claire anywhere. And you're sure not talking, taking her anywhere near that son of a bitch. She said. Which son of a bitch would that be exactly? Because, hey, she lives here. It's not like she's choosy about who she hangs out with. Eve bunched up her fist, and for a second Claire thought she was going to haul off and slug Monica right in her perfect, pouty mouth. But Eve checked herself. Barely. You so need to leave our house, Eve said. Now, before something bad happens that I won't really regret. 
Monica gave her a look. I'm sorry. Were you talking to me? Because I think I dropped off. Claire? I'm not here to banter with the mentally challenged. I'm just trying to be friendly. If you don't want to go, just say so. Claire felt ridiculously like laughing. It was so weird. Why was this happening to her? What do you really want? She asked. And Monica's lovely crazy eyes widened. Just a little. I want to talk to you about the Losers Club hanging over my shoulder. I figured we could have breakfast. But if you're allergic to caffeine and pastry, anything you can say to me, you can say in front of my friends, Claire said. That brought both of Monica's eyebrows up. Okay, your funeral, she said and glanced at Shane. So, where was your boyfriend last night after midnight? Who? Shane? What time had she left his room anyway? Late, but not after midnight. None of your damn business where I was, Shane said to Monica. Eve told you to get out. The next step is I throw your skanky ass and see if you bounce when you hit the porch. I don't care who pet you are. You don't come here and... Shane? Monica interrupted with elaborate calm. Shut the fuck up. I saw you, idiot. Claire waited for Shane to give her a biting comeback, but he just sat there, waiting. His eyes had gone very dark. They don't know, do they? Monica continued to, continued and tapped her rolled up coat copy of teen people against her hip. Wow. Shocker. Bad boy keeps secrets. That never happens. Shut up, Monica. Or you'll what? Kill me? She smiled. There wouldn't, there wouldn't even be DNA left when they were done with you, Shane. And the rest of you, too. And your families. What's she talking about? Eve asked. Shane? Nothing. Nothing, Monica mocked. Deny everything. That's a brilliant plan. Then again, it's what I'd expect from someone like you. Michael was frowning at Shane now, and Claire couldn't resist either. Shane's dark eyes darted to each of them in turn. Claire last. The cops aren't going to find any bodies out there in the alley, and they're not going to find one anywhere else in your house, Monica said. Because Shane moved a body last night at the back door. Shane still wasn't saying anything. Claire covered her mouth with her hand. No, she said. You're lying. Monica folded her arms. Why exactly would I do that? What, why would I admit to hanging around watching your house unless I had to? Embarrassing. Look, if I'm lying, all it takes is for him to deny it. Ask him. Go on. She was staring right at Shane. Shane's eyes narrowed, but he didn't say anything. For a frozen second or two, nobody moved and then Michael said, Christ, Shane, what the hell? Shut up! Shane snapped. I had to. I thought I heard something down in the basement last night when I was getting some water in the kitchen. So I went to check it out and... He stopped. Claire saw his hands up a bob as, as he swallowed. Hard. She was dead down there. At the bottom of the stairs. As if somebody had just thrown her. For a second I thought it was... He glanced at Eve, then away. I thought it was you. I thought you tripped and fallen down the stairs or something. But when I got down there, it wasn't you. And she was dead. Not just knocked out. Eve sank down on their arm of the sofa, looking as stunned as Claire felt. Who? Who was it? I didn't recognize her. Some college girl, I guess. She didn't look local, and she wasn't wearing a bracelet. Shane took in an audible deep breath. Look, we've been in enough trouble as it is. I had to get rid of her, so I wrapped her up in one of the blankets out of the boxes down there and carried her out. I put her in the trunk of your car. You what? Michael snapped. And I drove her to the church. I left her there, inside. I didn't want to just dump her. I thought Shane shook his head. I thought it was the right thing to do. Monica sighed. She was checking out her fingernails with exaggerated boredom. Yeah, yeah, touching. The point is, when I saw you, you were holding a dead chick into the trunk of his car. I just can't wait to tell my brother. You know my brother, right? The cop? Unbelievable. What do you want? Claire practically yelled at her. I told you. Breakfast. Monica gave her a sunny movie star smile. Please, if you say yes... 
I just could forget all about what I saw. Especially since I was, you know, out after curfew. And I don't want him to get asked about why. Think of it as a mutually assured destruction. It sounded like a deal, but it wasn't. Not really. Monica had all the cards, and they had none. Not at all. There's no body in the alley, Claire said. The police aren't going to find anything. You sure? Don't think so. Wouldn't that suck for you if they did? Monica shrugged, puckered her lips, and blew Shane a mocking kiss. You've got guts, Shane. No brains, but a whole lot of guts. You thought it out, right? Now that Michael's one of those chosen and dead, humans can't get into this house without an invitation. So you have to either blame on a vampire, or face up to the fact that one of you killed her. Either way, it's not going to be pretty, and somebody's going down. She held up her hand. I vote for Shane. Anybody else? Leave him alone, Claire said sharply. You want to get out? Fine, we'll go. No, don't you even start. Eve hadn't even had a chance to do more than open her mouth, and now she shut it fast. You guys work it out between the three of you. I won't be long, believe me. I probably won't be able to keep anything down whatever I manage to eat. Monica nodded, as if she'd known it would happen all along, and did a runway model's walk down the hall towards the front door. From the back, her shorts were barely legal. And however much they hated her, Shane and Michael were watching her go. Guys? Claire muttered and grabbed her backpack. Claire hadn't been inside common grounds in a while, but it hadn't changed. It was bohemian, warm, packed to the gills with college types, grabbing their morning, venti whatever. And if Claire hadn't known better, known very well, she'd never have believed that the nice, smiling hippie type behind the counter was a vampire. Oliver locked gazes with her and nodded slightly. His face stayed pleasant. Nice to see you back, he said. What it'll be. Much as she hated to admit it, he made the best drinks in town. Better than Eve, actually. White mocha, she said, with whip. She managed to hold back from adding anything more, because she didn't like being nice to him. God, he'd been licking blood off her wrist two hours ago. The least she could do was not say please and thank you. No charge, he said, and waved away the five dollar bill she dug out of her jeans pocket. A welcome back present, Claire. Ah, Monica. Your usual? Half calf, no foam, double pump latte with pink sugar, she said. In a real cup, not that foam stuff. A simple yes would suffice, he said. As Monica started to turn away, he reached out and grabbed her wrist. He did it in such a way that nobody but Claire would notice. But it was unmistakably threatening. She doesn't pay you. She doesn't pay. You do, Monica. You may think of yourself as a princess, but trust me, I've met them, and you don't qualify. He grinned just a little, but there was no humour in his eyes. Well, perhaps met isn't quite the right word. Ian? Claire supp supplied ac acidly. His smile turned darker. Oh, the charm and eloquence of the younger generation. It does warm my heart. Monica let go of Monica's arm and stepped away to make the drinks. Monica backed away, looking flushed. She threw a dirty look at Claire. Yeah, like it's my fault. Claire thought and stalked to the table in the corner. The one the deceased vampire Brandon had once staked out, pun intended, as his own. There were two young college girls sitting there, with books and papers piled up. Monica folded her arms and took up a belligerent pose. You're in my chair, she said. Move. The two girls, shorter and pudgier than Monica, set up with saucer huge eyes. One of them stammered. Which of us? Both, Monica snapped. I like my space. Get out. They gathered up papers and books and hurried away, nearly dumping coffee all over Claire in their haste to go. Did you have to do that? Claire asked. No. It was just fun, Monica sat, crossed her smooth, tanned legs and patted the table. Come on, Claire. Have a seat. We have so much to talk about. She didn't want to, but it was stupid to stand there, looking ov obvious. So she sat, dumped her backpack on the floor next to her feet, and concentrated on the scarred wood of the tabletop. She could see Monica's flip-flop living up to its name on the other girl casually jiggled her foot. Ridiculously, it reminded her of Mernin. That's better. Monica sounded way too pleased with herself. Not cool. So, 
Tell me about it. About what? Whatever Meenlin's got you doing, Monica said. Your super secret stuff, I mean. She picked you for a reason, and it's not for your charm and good looks, right? Obviously, it's for your brains. You don't have any family here. You've got nothing no anybody wants other than that. Monica was smarter than she looked. Her means not asking me to do anything, Claire lied. Maybe she will later. I don't know. But she hasn't yet. She nervously twisted the gold bracelet circling her left wrist. It was starting to remind her of those bands biologists put on endangered species and lab animals. Monica's eyes were half closed when Claire risked a glance upward. Huh, she said. Really? Well, that's disappointing. I really thought you had something good I could use. Oh well. Let's talk about making a deal. A deal? First Jason, now Monica. How had Claire stepped into the role of negotiator? I want to talk to Amelia about protection. You can give me an introduction. And a recommendation. Claiming the left. Ask yourself! I would. But she won't let me near her. She doesn't like me. I'm shocked. Claire muttered under her breath. Monica gave her a long look, one strangely missing the usual hip, ironic, contemptuous features. It looked almost earnest. Since Brandon died, Oliver took over his contracts. The thing is, he's not keeping most of them. He's trading them for favours with other vampires. If I don't make a better deal, there's no telling what could happen to me. Monica pointed at Claire's bracelet. And that's the start of the top. Claire jumped her short fingernails on the table, glaring at the bar where it seemed like Oliver was taking forever to deliver their drinks. It occurred to her to wonder if it was really safe to drink something prepared by a vampire who'd been threatening her just a couple of hours before. But honestly, if Oliver wanted to get her, it wasn't as though it would be hard for him to do. And she really wanted the white mocha. Oliver's your patron now? For now. Until he finds something he wants, more than holding on to my contract anyway. Is he behind you asking about why he merely signed me up? Do I look like I run somebody else's errands? Claire glanced back again at the bar. Maybe. Monica went quiet. It wasn't a comfortable kind of silence. And Claire was glad when Oliver called over their, out their orders. She jumped up to get hers, hesitated, and then picked up Monica's as well. She managed to do it without making eye contact with Oliver. It was just a dark shape at the corner of her eye, and she turned her back on him as soon as she could. Monica got up, and she looked honestly surprised when Claire handed her a drink. What? Claire asked. It's called being polite. The probably didn't teach you that at home. Doesn't mean I like you or anything. Monica seemed to have to think hard about what to say to that and finally came up with a simple thanks, which, Claire had to admit, might have been the nicest thing Monica had ever managed to say to her. Claire gave her a nod and sat down again. Peace now time, she thought wearily, and promptly blew it by asking again, did Oliver put you up to it? Monica didn't even glance in his, in his direction. No, but somehow Claire didn't believe her. Do you have anything, do you have to do everything he says? she asked, as if Monica hadn't just lied, and Monica lifted one shoulder in a half shrug. No other answer. So you don't really want to talk to me, do you? You've just been told to do it. Not exactly. I thought it was a good chance to get my name in front of Emily too. Monica smiled slightly, and very bitterly. Besides, check it out. You're a star. Everybody wants to know about you, vampires and humans. They're looking to your history, your family's history. If you farted in grade school, somebody in Mongolville knows about it. Claire almost choked on her first mouthful of white mocha. What? The founder isn't what you might call accessible, and most of the vamps don't understand her any better than we do. They're always looking for clues about who she is, what she's doing here with this town. This isn't normal, you know, the way they live here. Monica's gaze flickered to Oliver, then away. He's old enough to know more than most, but he still needs inside information, and the word is, you could be that way to get it. If I can't get protection from Amelie, at least I can get in good with him if I have something new and valuable to tell him. Claire rolled her eyes. I'm nobody. And if she cared about me at all, which she doesn't, she'd never let anybody know it. I mean, look how she treats. She stopped herself. Cold. Heart suddenly hammering fast. She'd almost said Mernin, and that would have been bad. Sam, she finished lamely, which was also true. But Monica had to notice her stumble. 
But Monica emphasis by waiting for a full 10 seconds of silence before she continued. Whatever. The point is, you're a sort of famous. And by hanging with you, I get seen by the right people, doing the right thing, and I do what Oliver wants. Which is all I care about. You're right. I don't care if we're BFFs. We're not going to trade clothes and get matching tattoos. I've got friends. I need allies. She sits her complicated drink, her eyes steady on Claire. Oliver wants what you know, yeah. And this. She taps her own bracelet. This says that I do what he says. Or else. Or else what? Monica looked down. You've met him. Best case, it means he hurts me. Bad? Worst case, he trades me down. That's worse? Yeah. That means I get handed to the bottom of the barrel of amps. The ones too lame to get the good earn. Earners and pretty people. That means I'm a loser. She looked down and fidgeted with her creamy ceramic coffee cup frowning at it. Sounds shallow? Maybe. But around here, it's survival. If Oliver blackballs me, I can't get anything but the freaks and the shanks ganks. The ones who get their fix the hard way. They'll kill me, if I'm lucky. If not, I end up some strung out junkie fangbanger. She said it with such dry matter of fact intensity that Claire could tell she'd spent a lot of time thinking about it. It was a long way to fall from the darling daughter of the mayor to come addicted to try some addict trying to please a key, kinky freak for protection. You could be neutral, Claire blurted. She felt oddly sympathetic. Even after everything Monica had done, she had been born here after all. Not like she'd ever had a real choice in what she was going to be or do. Some people are, right? Were they left alone? Monica sneered at and the second or two of humanity Claire had imagined she'd seen that pretty face vanished. They're left alone until then, not. Look, officially, they're untouchable because they've done favours, big favours, and their patrons let them out of contracts. By big favours, I mean the kind they were lucky to live through, get it? I'm not interested in that kind of hero crap. Claire shrugged, then go without a contract. Yeah, right, that works. I'm really looking forward to a future as second assistant fry wrangler at the Dairy Queen, and decomposing in some ditch by the before I'm 30. Monica rested her elbows on the table, coffee cup cradled in both hands. I thought about leaving. I actually went to Austin for a semester, you know? But it wasn't the same. Meaning you flunked out of school? That earned Claire a filthy look. Shut up, bitch! I'm here only because I need to be, and you're here only because you have to be. Let's not get too touchy-feely. Claire swallowed a mouthful of sweet, rich mocha. If it was poison, she'd die happy, at least. Fine by me. Look, I can't help you get to Amelie. I don't even know how to get to her myself. And if I did, I don't think she'd take your contract. Then just shut up and smile. If I don't get anything out of this wasted morning, at least Oliver can see that I tried. How long do I have to do this? Monica checked her watch. Ten minutes. Snack it up that long. And I won't call my brother about your boyfriend's little indiscretion. How can I be sure? Monica sat both hands to her cheeks and looked over dramatically horrified. Oh no, you don't trust me. I'm crushed. She dropped the act. I don't care if Shane has opened his own corpse taxi service. I care only about what I can get out of it. Maybe you want revenge, Claire said. Monica smiled. <laughs> if I'd wanted that, I'd have already turned him in. Besides, I know it's best to have called. Claire pulled out a book. All right, ten minutes. I need to study anyway. Monica sat back and began a running, acid, acidly accurate monologue on the outfits of the girl standing in line for coffee, which Claire tried earnestly not to find funny, which she was able to do, until Monica pointed out a girl wearing a truly horrible polka dot leggings under shorts, ensemble, and somehow in heaven, Assess sheds a single perfect tear. Claire couldn't control a snort of laughter, and hated herself for it. Monica cocked an eyebrow. See? She said. I'm so good I can even charm a hard case like you. It's a waste of my talent, but I need to keep myself sharp. She finished her coffee and picked up her little pink purse with the Teen People magazine sticking out of it. Got a fly, loser. Tell your boyfriend as far as I'm concerned, we're even. Okay, I'm a little bit more than even, but that's the way I like it. Consider this his restraining order. If I see him within 50 feet of me, I'll not only tell my brother about Shane's midnight adventure, but I'll get some football types to pay his kneecaps a visit. She walked out, 
hips swaying dangerously. People got out of the way, and they watched her go. Fear and attraction, in just about equal measure. Claire sighed. She supposed people always did like that sort of girl, and always would. And secretly, she envied Monica's confidence. Maybe just a little. Te traitorous bit. Hello everyone, thank you for listening to the um, the audio file or audio reading I've done of a Rachel Kane book. Um, I'm putting this in there, so if you want to skip past this bit and move on to the next video, that's fine by me. This is just like a cancer plug, because I want to do this, as well as also I have to do this, because the thing you've just listened to is illegal for me to do, without having a charity case behind it which is feel i don't want it to be like a situation like oh i'm only doing this for the sake of cancer which i'm actually doing this for the sake of cancer but i did cancel this series a long long time ago it came to my recent attention that i should redo this in a better format and i feel like now is a perfect opportunity to actually restart this in the worst possible way back in in first of november back in 2020 rachel kane sadly passed away to a rare bone cancer called sarcoma. Now, in the description below is going to be a link that you can... It's going to be a link so you can support the uh, research into helping people survive and defeat sarcoma bone cancer and soft tissue cancer cells and all that stuff. So that's just going to be in the description right there down below. It is in pounds for those American ones, but obviously PayPal and all the research still goes to the same thing because once it's being cured, once they found a cure for it or found an easier solution for it and stuff like that it does get sent around all around the world because everyone works on the same thing all over the world it's just that this charity is based in uk i live in the uk so it still goes to the same goal to beat sarcoma for a long time and i feel like this is the best opportunity to work with it for any rachel king books that we do during the morganville series or any future series that we do obviously this is even going to be in the future series if we do do them so any book that we do by Rachel Kane is going to have this at the end just to plug a little bit of a cancer support for people with sarcoma because it is a rare, rare cancer and there is not a very good survival rate. So just putting that in there to help people or to support the issues that are out there because I'm not going to get any money from these videos at all, even in like the present one. I'm not getting any money of this recording or in the future, if possibly I do. But this is not what I'm about. This is all about for for what Rachel Kane succumbed to in the end. So hopefully that as a team together we can beat sarcoma and end one of the cancers that are killing people. Because no one likes that. But anyway, have a good day.